our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. On one occasion, the disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To their surprise, the Lord Jesus brought a child into their midst. And in Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, he declared, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Child likeness is the way to greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Moreover, child likeness is the way to citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. You must become like a little child to be accepted into God's kingdom. But here's the blessing. To be accepted into God's kingdom is to be adopted by the king. Let me say that again. Citizens of the kingdom are actually children of the king. Jesus affirms this truth in the invocation of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven. The Lord's Prayer, of course, is a part of the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus explains to his followers that kingdom citizenship requires true righteousness. That is, righteousness, not just religiosity. The immediate context of our passage is Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8, in which Jesus teaches how righteous people pray. To be, in fact, to be more accurate, in verses 5 through 8, Jesus teaches how not to pray. Verses 5 and 6 instruct us not to pray like the hypocrites whose motivation for prayer is wrong. Verses 7 and 8 instruct us not to pray like the Gentiles whose method of prayer is wrong. In fact, verse 8 summarizes all of these prohibitions when Jesus says, do not be like them. For your father knows what you need even before you ask. We should not pray like hypocrites. We should not pray like heathens. How then should we pray? Jesus answers this question in verses 9 through 13. It is called the Lord's Prayer. Let me be clear. It is the Lord's Prayer prayer in the sense that he taught it, not in the sense that he prayed it. This is not a prayer that Jesus himself could pray because in verse 12, he will teach us to pray, forgive us our debts. And Jesus doesn't have any debts that need to be forgiven. Thank God for that. This is a model prayer. What we see in the opening words of verse 9 where Jesus says, pray then like this. Jesus is showing his disciples how to approach God in prayer. And the opening words of this model prayer teach us how to address God when we pray. Our Father in heaven. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, you can approach God in prayer as our Father in heaven. 
There are two wonderful truths in this invocation that I want you to see as quickly as I can that I hope will give you greater confidence when you pray. Here's the first truth. God is our Father. God is our Father. The personal name of God, Yahweh, was called the ineffable name. Israel would dare not call God by this name lest they may take his name in vain. They address God with many other names and those names reflected a holy distance between God and Israel. God is only called Father seven times in the Old Testament and never in a personal sense. In contrast, Jesus calls God Father 10 times in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18. And here, in verse 9, Jesus teaches us to do the same. He says, when you pray, you should approach God like this, our Father in heaven. Let's just start with the first two words here. Our Father, to pray with those terms, is a statement of faith, in Jesus Christ and fellowship with the church. On one hand, to pray our Father expresses faith in Jesus Christ. You see, there is a real sense in which every human being is a child of God. Malachi chapter 2 verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? And in Acts 17, verse 28, Paul says to the scholars on Mars hills, we are all his offspring. God is the father of all humanity because God created us. But let's be clear. James chapter 1, verse 18, calls God the father of lights. In other words, he is the creator of the sun, moon, and stars. But Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, says about the new Jerusalem, it says the city will need no sun or moon to shine in it. For the glory of God will give light to the city, and the Lamb is the lamp of the city. In other words, Unbelieving sinners will go to heaven the same day God needs light bulbs to illuminate heaven. God is the father of all human beings only in the sense that he made us and he sustained us. But every person does not have the right to call God our father. Sinners have another father. In James chapter 8, John, that is John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says to unbelievers, you are of your father, the devil. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of this, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The unsaved are sons of disobedience. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 The Bible says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God and whoever does not love his brother. So the bottom line, church, is that there is just no such thing as some universal family, some 
idea of one big spiritual family of mankind under the universal fatherhood of God. Only those who are born again are, in the words of Peter, partakers of the divine nature. John chapter 1, verse 12, we are told, but as many as receive Christ, as many as believe in his name gave he the right to be called the children of God. You, you don't have a right automatically, but God in Christ gives us the right to be called the sons of God. I, I knew I'd be in this predicament, so I brought my own witness. Nicodemus showed up one night to talk about, talk to Jesus, assume him, He was a child of God because he was a religious scholar. But in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Later in John 3, verses 6 and 7, Jesus says, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is is spirit. So do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Friend, to to sincerely pray these simple words, our Father in heaven, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be adopted into God's family through faith in Jesus Christ. Human beings are God's children through creation. Christians are God's children through regeneration and adoption. But only Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Jesus calls God Father more than 150 times in the Gospels. He only calls God, God, once. And that's when he was dying on the cross to get me and you in the family. The Bible says in Matthew 27, verse 46, as Jesus hung on the cross in the darkness at high noon, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I got to move on, but let me just say, thank God that ain't the last word from the cross. Before he died, John 19, 30 says, Jesus cried out, it is finished. The son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men may become the sons of God. We are children of God through faith in the finished work of Christ. And so for you to pray, our Father in heaven, let me ask you, how are things today between you and the Lord Jesus Christ? If things are not right between you and Christ, I plead with you today, friend, run to the cross. Trust his atoning blood and throw yourself on the mercy of God poured out through our risen Savior. Our Father is a statement of faith in Jesus Christ, but I need to also tell you it's a statement of fellowship with the church. The Lord's Prayer teaches us to use plural pronouns in prayer. Us, we, our, not singular pronouns, I, me, my. This corporate dynamic is is emphasized from the very invocation. Our father, not my father. In the opening line of the prayer, Jesus is saying, when you pray, remember you ain't an only child. God is your father, but you are not an only child. Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father 
who is in secret. Secret prayer keeps you from turning prayer before God into a performance before people. However, secret prayer is not a license to disconnect from people. Ultimately, all prayer is corporate prayer. You, you cannot, you really cannot ever come before the throne of God the Father without bringing your brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got to pray our Father. The, the Lord's Prayer is the answer to Cain's centuries-old question. Jesus, by teaching us to pray our Father, is declaring, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Some people who read the Lord's Prayer are offended that Jesus would teach us to pray to God as Father. But I want to suggest that even more scandalous is, is, is the title Father is the pronoun our. J Jesus is teaching us here how to pray as the church, not merely as individuals. He is saying to us, Christianity is inherently communal. You, you are not meant to make this adventure of faith by yourself. We we are brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers, and whoever does not love his brother abides in death. God's children. If you check the birth certificate of a person who's truly born again, it will reflect both Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for all the saints. It's amazing. We think we can live a Christian life without others, but you didn't get saved by yourself. You didn't get saved by walking in the woods by yourself, staring up at the stars. You definitely didn't think up the gospel by yourself. Someone presented the gospel to you. Someone lived out the gospel to you and before you and cause you to take the claims of Christ seriously. Someone, for many of us, prayed us into the kingdom when we were far away from God. E even if you, you got saved just reading the Bible by yourself. Remember, the, the Bible is the word of God to man through man. And, and it's about redemptive history through which God works through a sinless Savior and sinful people. I'm trying to get you to see that we are saved by grace alone. God is the source of grace. Jesus is the means of grace. The Holy Spirit is the agent of grace. But we are meant to be channels of grace in Christ to one another. It is called the communion of the saints. This, 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 this model prayer attacks our pride. It, it attacks the desire in us to be independent of everything and everyone. J Jesus, first of all, commands us to pray, which forces us to acknowledge we can't do it by ourselves. He further Commands us to pray to the Heavenly Father, which acknowledges that we got problems only God can fix. Let me say that again. We got problems only God can fix. But, but he also bids us to pray to our Father in heaven, which acknowledges that when we go to the Father for help, we must pray for others and not just for ourselves. If you, if you only pray for yourself, you got big problems. Your, your prayer life can't be strong if you never get around to praying for anyone but yourself. You are not an only child. You have brothers and sisters in Christ who also have needs that you should be concerned about. Farmers pray 
farmers pray, Lord, hear not the prayers of a traveling man. Hear not the prayers of a traveling man. A, a, a traveling man journeying through a community prays for fair weather because he don't want to walk in the rain. And he doesn't care about the fact that the community desperately needs rain for their crops to grow. By telling us to pray our Father, Jesus is saying, pray like a family man, not a traveling man. Don't forget you are not an only child. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who also have needs we should take before God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 simply says it this way. Do not look after your own interests only. You got interests. You got concerns. And it's all right to focus on them. The Bible just says in Philippians 2 and 4, don't stop with your own concerns. Be concerned with the interests of others. The first truth that gives us confidence to pray is that God is our Father. The second truth that gives us confidence to pray is this, God is in heaven. God is in heaven. On April 26, 1862, the author and editor Thomas Higginson received a letter from a, an expiring poet named Emily Dickinson, referring to her parents and siblings. Emily wrote, they are religious except me. And they address and eclipse every morning whom they call their father. Unfortunately, this is how many people view prayer. As if we're talking to an eclipse, calling it father. But God is no eclipse. First John 1 and 5 actually says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is not an eclipse that hides the light. He himself is the light. But to see him clearly as our father in heaven, you must view him through the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. During the last supper, it took place before Good Friday. Jesus kept giving final instructions in which he constantly referred to the father this, the father that, the father the other, until uh, Philip couldn't take it anymore. And he says, look, this, this is a desperate time. All this father talk doesn't help us. Show us the father, and it'll satisfy us. If, if, if all of this is so bad, talk won't do. Show us the father. Jesus said to Philip, in John 14, verse 9, have I been so long with you, Philip, and you don't know who I am? F Philip, you, you asking, as Jerome Kirby would say, you asking an elementary question on graduation day. You've you been with me for three years now and don't know who I am. Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. T to see Jesus is to see God. Jesus reveals God to be our Father in heaven. And as our Father in heaven, we can pray with confidence. In heaven means two things. It means God cares and God is able. God cares. In his book on the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven, Warren Worsby writes of being confronted by a young man after teaching a Bible class for college students who say, you claim that God is a father? Whereas we say, yes, that's what the Bible teaches. The young man gave Worsby an angry look and said, if God is like my father, I'm not interested. And he stormed off. This is the perspective of many who never knew their father or grew up without their father. Uh, others have fathers who are so violent 
abusive, negligent, or uncaring that they wish they were not there. As a result, many people conclude if God is a father, they don't want anything to do with him. But our father, watch me, in heaven teaches us to reject the notion that God is impersonal or insensitive or indifferent. God is not merely the first cause or some unmoved mover or the ground of all things. He is our heavenly father. He is our model father. He is the perfect father. I'm not sure if you get what I'm saying, but I'm trying to tell you that you don't have to drag God to court to get God to acknowledge his kids or take care of his children. He's the heavenly father. You, you, you should not judge God by the failings of human fathers. Instead, you should view human fathers by the holy and high standard of God's paternal care for his children. I just want to tell you, with all this going on, and I don't have explanations for it, but I can hear my mama singing, we are our heavenly father's children. And he knows just how much we can bear. God cares. That's what I'm trying to tell you. God cares. When your body is sick, God cares when your heart is broken. God cares when your pockets are empty. God cares when your faith is attacked. God cares when your relationships are struggling. God cares when your strength is low. God cares when your dreams are shattered. Psalm 103 verse 13 says, As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11 says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says that you did not receive the spirit of slavery so that you should fall back again into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption by which you could cry out, Abba, Father. This is particularly good news, friend, if you are watching and struggling with guilt and shame over sin. I got good news for you. The heavenly father even cares for prodigal children. <laughs> you, you may have strayed away from God in the far country, but God still loves you. God still cares about you. God is still waiting on you to come back home to him. Now, that doesn't mean there will be no consequences for your sin. God is not some TV sitcom children, uh, parent that is, who addresses his children's rebellion with a nice story at the end of the show. God knows how to whip his children. But, but, but the good news is, Hebrews 12 says, whom he loves, he chastises. Even when he's whipping you, it means he still got his hands on you. He cares. God cares. Not just that, God is able. Prayer is a privilege. But you know that to yourself? Prayer is a privilege. Prayer is not some burden, some duty to endure. Prayer is a wonderful privilege to enjoy. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. You, you can come with confidence to the throne of grace. But let me say that you must come to the throne of grace on God's terms, not yours. Notice that Jesus teaches us here that you are not free to address God any way you choose in prayer. God's son instructs us how to address God in prayer. 
our Father in heaven. Hear me. God is not our mother in heaven. This is not a statement against womanhood or motherhood or femininity. In fact, Isaiah chapter 49 verse 15 says, can a woman forget her nursing child that that she would have no compassion on the son of her womb? The, The rhetorical question assumes that a mother will love her child no matter what. But then the rest of that verse, Isaiah 49, verse 15 says, these may forget. It may get to a place where a mama forgets her child, but God says, I will never forget you. In fact, in that 16th verse, he says, I love this. I've graven you on my hands. I've I've tattooed you on my hands so that every time I start working, I can't help but think about you. God has a maternal compassion for his redeemed children. Yet scripture never instructs us to address God as mother, teaches us to pray to God as our father in heaven. John 4, 24 says God is spirit, so he is neither male nor female. Yet God reveals himself as father, not mother. And this attribution is not just about divine relationship. It's about sovereign authority. God is our Father in heaven. God is omnipresent. He's never late, tardy, nor absent. He's fully present everywhere at the same time, yet he is our Father in heaven. In heaven means he's transcendent. It means he's infinitely above us, and beyond us. Solomon built a temple to worship God in. He, had a, he, he spent much of his life building a building so that God's people could gather in it to worship. But in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, after he built it, he asked God in prayer, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the highest heaven can't contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Let me tell you what Solomon was saying that you need to get. Nothing on earth can stop the Father in heaven. Nothing on earth can hinder the Father in heaven. Nothing on earth can overrule the Father who is in heaven. To say he's in heaven is to say he's in charge. God is untouched, but he's not uncaring. God is transcendent, yet he is imminent. If I could just say it the way the old saints would say it, God sits high, but he looks low. Ah, church, it's one thing to have friends in high places. It's another thing to have a father in high places. Jesus says, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our father in heaven. The father was away from his family for extended periods in military duty. His son comforted himself in his daddy's absence by placing a picture of his daddy in the frame next to his bed on the nightstand. And in the middle of the night when he was afraid, he would turn over and see the picture of his daddy in the frame and it would comfort him. One, one night, however, it didn't work. And his mother rushed in the room hearing the cries of her son and wanted to know what the matter was. And through tears, The boy just simply said, I want daddy to come out the frame. The Bible presents God as a heavenly father. But many times when you are going through something, it just feels like God is 
in a frame and can't be touched. Uh, uh, he, he did it for Daniel, but what about me? He did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but what about me? It seems like God is in the frame, but I declare in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God stepped out the frame. He became one of us, and the life of Jesus is divine proof. God cares about you, and God is able to meet your need. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Praise God for his word.